All right, welcome back. I know we missed last week on this lesson, but we're catching up this week. Uh, we're in lesson six, the culmination of our hope as we continue going through First Peter. A uh, couple of things, make sure you have your Bible, make sure you have a pen, make sure you have a notebook to write in. And we're gonna be pausing throughout, asking questions so you can journal down as you go forward with it. If you're watching with someone else, pause it, have a good time for discussion. So pause right now, go get those things, come back, we'll get started. C.S. Lewis, famous Christian writer, didn't believe in God, came to know God later in uh, a relationship with Jesus later on in life, wrote Mere Christianity. He, C.S. Lewis lived through both world wars and understood all too well uh, all the problems and pain of the world history, especially during that time. But many were suffering greatly across his homeland in Great Britain, throughout Europe and the Pacific, and additionally, Lewis mourned the death of his wife, uh, Joy, who passed away after an illness during their brief marriage. Yet the suffering and setbacks that dotted Lewis's life only seemed to fuel his writings. In one of his greatest accomplishments, Mere Christianity, for example, Lewis wrote, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. Because Christians have been given eternal life in the coming kingdom of God, we have hope. We have a hope in Christ. And the trials of this life in one day will give way to a life of eternal joy and eternal peace. And this is the life that we endure until the life to come in which we truly belong to. Back, as I would say, in that perfect relationship with God. And spiritually, we're in that perfect relationship, but physically, we're not because of the world around us. But one day, we'll be there. So the point for our lesson today is what we hope for in Christ will one day be fully attained. And that's what Peter writes about as we're going through as, as the churches that he's writing to in Turkey are starting to see persecution. It's not really getting physical yet, but it's getting in the shunning and the uh, exclusion of certain things that they can do. But in chapter 5, Peter concluded his letter with some practical wisdom and instruction for those facing persecution. And his teaching may not be what the readers expected from him. Here they are talking about persecution breaking out. And, and, and remember back, when, when they go to arrest Jesus, Peter's the one chopping off the guard's ear. So they're they could be expecting that kind of Peter to show up in the midst of this of, hey, what do we do in this time, in this tumultuous, in this, uh, that's, a, that's a weird word there, in this uh, conflict that we have, what do we do? And Peter comes and gives this explanation that he, that he provides in this, this passages of how he practically lived within, in the midst of persecution. When we think about standing among any kinds of opposition, most of us would probably seek to be bold and courageous. Uh, however, Peter encouraged his dear friends to face their trials with humility. Face your trials with humility. So 1 Peter chapter 5, starting in the second half of verse 5, going through verse 7, it says, All of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another, because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. And because see, when we humble ourselves, God exalts us. And that carries way more weight than me exalting myself. Are you exalting yourself? But when we humble ourselves, God exalts us. Humility creates an atmosphere of intimacy with God. And no human can strut before our Savior. I would love to sit here and look at it and say, God, look at everything that I've done for you. Look at everything I've done in this life. But that holds no bearing with God. Humility creates an atmosphere of intimacy with God. Humility is directly related to our submission to God and his authority. And, and as we submit, we recognize that one, he is sovereign in our life. He controls everything in our life. His grace and provisions in our suffering uh, when we submit, we realize that we have to submit and say, God, we're trusting in you and your grace and you providing for us in the midst of the suffering. But also when we submit the sacrifice, uh, we recognize the sacrifice of his only son that gives us this hope. 
by us submitting, we understand that he is sovereign. We understand that he is gracious, gracious, and he provides very graciously. But we also understand about the sacrifice. We recognize it's only through his son that we have hope. So humility acknowledges that none of those gifts could have come from our own hand. Nothing that we could have done could have sit here and, and made us look better in the eyes of God. They're a gift of grace from a powerful, loving Father who cares deeply for us. In this position of humble surrender to God, we yield our cares and our anxieties to Him. We humbly acknowledge that we can do nothing about those things that burden us, but the one who cares for us can. What are some characteristics? What are some characteristics that you think of, of a person who is proud? When you think of, hey, that's a proud person, what are some characteristics that you would think of? And, and before we pause and before you think about that and jot it down, here's a second question. How easy or difficult is it to give your cares to God? So what do you think of when it comes to attributes of God, well, of a proud person? What are attributes that come to your mind? But secondly, how easy or difficult is it for you uh, to give your cares to God? Pause right now, jot that down, come back, and we'll continue on in our conversation. I think sometimes when we look at um, characteristics of a proud person, we like to see people who are man, self-made people. Uh, they're very proud. They don't bend. They don't break. Uh, kind of the difference of what we would think of in a humble person, right? They talk about everything that they've done and all the things that they have overcome. But a humble person talks about what other people have done and how other people have been overcome. I think back, uh, I know this is going to be a weird analogy, but Bobby Knight, uh, one of the most winning college basketball coaches ever, and he was known for a bad temper. He was known for his pride. But when it came, when he got the, the most wins of all of the basketball before he retired, when he sat there and had that victory, they said, what do you think about all your success? And Bobby Knight, who's normally a very proud, confident person, sits there and says, hey, don't, don't worry about me. Let's talk about all these people that got me here. And he starts pulling people in. And he starts asking them, it's like, this guy was a great guy. I mean, it's one of the reasons why, why I have so many wins because of this guy here. I have all these wins because of this guy here. And when it, you would think at a time where this person that does come across very arrogant at a lot of things, very tempered, and you see this huge success, you think he'd sit here and talk about how great he was. He just sat here and started calling people out of the stands that came to watch his game, that were players that played under him and that were assistant coaches that, that coached with him. And he's like, man, this is a great guy. You need to talk to this guy. You need to talk to this player. You need to talk to this guy. And it's just one of those moments that you think he would just seize and talk about how great he was. And instead, he just pulled up all the great people that he had around him during that time. So when I think of proud people, I think of people that toot their own horn, people that talk about how great they are. But when I think of humble people, I think of people that pull everyone up us on the stage and say, these are the people why I'm here because of what they've done, not because of what I've done. How is it, is it, how easy or difficult is it for us to give our cares to God? I know it depends on the situation. Some things are easy for me to say, God, I'm going to hand that over to you. Other things are really hard because I love to hand things to God, but I love to take them back to, right? So when we think of, when we think of uh, giving our cares to God, we've got to remember that God's strength is always greater than our strength. God's strength is always greater than my strength. And some, some, some uh, specific ways that Christians can cast their cares upon God. Let's just look through a couple of these. If you have your uh, uh, personal book with you, this is in there. What are some, some specific ways that Christians can cast their cares upon God? Uh, what about prayer? You know, uh, Can you cast your cares upon God through prayer? Uh, what about through worship? What about through spiritual conversations? And as I list these out, if you need to stop and jot down some of how, how you express these, this would be a great opportunity. How do you express prayer and cast your cares upon God through prayer? How do you cast your cares upon God through worship, through spiritual conversations, through reading your Bible, through silence? Because a lot of times I know silence is really a good discipline for us to learn. 
A lot of times in prayer, we think it's us talking to God, but you got to understand prayer is a conversation, which means at some point you got to be silent to let God talk back to you. And a lot of times when we, what we call prayer is a one-way street. And then when we're silenced, then we can have that prayer conversation coming back from God. Not that he's praying to us, but that we receive his instruction as well. So sometimes just being silent, Listen for the Holy Spirit as He nudge and guide you, which means, yeah, all the distractions that you have. Turn the TVs off. Turn the radios off. Turn your phones off. Turn all those distractions off and just sit and meditate and listen for God. And He'll hear your concerns and your cares. And you'll hear His as well in your life. What about casting your cares upon God through fasting or serving others or fellowship or even journaling, as I've been encouraging as we go through these lessons, just jotting down what God's speaking to you so you can remember later, look back on it. What are some other things maybe that you're thinking of that you can write down and say, you know what, I cast my cares upon God this way, and I can see this fruit in my life because of it. As we move on to our second point, 1 Peter 5, chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, it says, be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. As we look at this passage, we think, one, when we resist Satan, we can remain firm in the midst of suffering. We can remain firm in the midst of suffering. I even like the part that jumps out of nine and says, realize that even that resist him, be firm in the faith. The same kind of sufferings that you experience, don't think you're the only one. And a lot of times when, when persecution hits us or, or bad times hit us, we just think, oh, woe is me, why me? But Peter says, you need to realize you're not the only one. There are others that are experiencing that and far worse than you. But remember, resist him. Be firm in the faith. Right? Remember how great our God was in the previous section? Here, the same great God. That if we're humble, God will lift us up. Here, be sober-minded. Know your enemy because you know how great your Heavenly Father is. But know your enemy and resist him as well. When we humble ourselves before God, we should also be ready and watchful because whenever we're in a right relationship with God and we're humbled before God, Satan wants to attack. We should not grow lax or underestimate the fierceness of our enemy. And sometimes I think we either hyper, uh, give too much credit to Satan, and then I think we turn and do the opposite. We give not enough credit to Satan in some of these areas. But Peter describes the devil as a vivid image of one who is strong, one who is loud and relentless. When Jesus was being tempted, I think it was in the Mark passage. I could be wrong on that, but I think it's the Mark passage when it says that, and then Satan left him to tempt him at a later time. And the actual Greek there says, when, Satan, when, when Jesus was tempted the three times by Satan, it says Satan left. But he didn't stay gone long because the implication there was is that Satan was going to keep coming to tempt Jesus moment by moment. And when you see that the Pharisees are testing him, when you see that, that people are, are questioning him being the Messiah and all these healings that he's doing and, and the people around him are throwing the verbal stones at him, I guess, to put jabs at him. That's Satan constantly testing him and tempting him along the way. So I think that's what we need to see is that he's strong, he's loud, he's relentless. And if he didn't give up on Jesus and kept tempting Jesus, he's going to keep tempting us as well. So, so cert certainly these verses weren't intended to scare us, but be awake, church. Be awake, believer. There is an enemy out there. He's not more powerful than God, but he is out there. And he is looking to see who he can devour. The battle is raging. The enemy's real. The days of evil and the time is short. So he's getting more and more panicked because he knows every day is a day closer to his eternal punishment. The devil's strong, but our faith is the foundation of our resistance. We don't resist through sheer determination or force. And too many times I think that's what we do is we, we, we try to change our character and our behavior and say, I'm just going to try harder. I'm going to be better versus I'm going to be a better follower of Christ. Because Michael Blue did nothing to save himself and Michael Blue cannot try any harder to be a better Christian or a better person or to get sin out of my life. 
But when I'm humble and when I trust that my God is greater than me, then God can come in and change me. God can come in and move. It's not just willpower that I have to be a better person. It's God's power that comes in and makes me a better person. So we don't resist through sheer determination or effort. We resist the devil in the firm assurance of our belief that he is a defeated foe and we serve a conquering king. So how would you describe the way the devil works in our culture? I bet if we paused right now, you could probably write a whole page on this, right? How would you describe the way the devil works in our culture? But also, what are some ways that we can actively resist the devil? What are some ways that we can resist the devil when we know he comes to tempt us? Um, and then how can our church grow in awareness of and prayer for Christians around the world facing serious persecution? So three big questions there. Let's pause, jot down some answers to those questions. If you need to rewind to get one of those questions, you can. But let's just pause and think on that for a moment. As we come back, I'm just going to address one of these questions. Just what, what are some ways that we can actively resist the devil? I think one, it depends. we got to know our weaknesses and know that he's going to tend to attack us and our sin habits. So if we're always in the forefront of our mind what our sin habits are, then we won't easily be ensnared or trapped by it. So I know what my deficiencies are. And I'm always trying to be on guard to make sure I don't stumble in that area. Now, with that being said, he's going to attack in a lot of areas, but I just know, don't give him the easy. Don't give him the low-hanging fruit either. Don't give him the easy way for us to get trapped. So I just know that if this is my personality, how my personality works, I am always at guard against this. Now, that may be different for you. It may not even be a sin issue for you, but it's my sin issue. And I always have a guardrail up there. I can't get anywhere close to that or I'm going off the edge. Whereas yours may be over here and that's not a problem for me, but I got to know me. So I know where Satan likes to attempt me. Why? Because that's my sin habits that I've had from my past. And I'm going to stay away from them as far as possible. All right, moving on. First Peter 5, chapter 10, verse 11. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. To him be dominion forever. Amen. And we need to know that God will ultimately restore us to his eternal glory. Peter magnified the brilliance of God from whom every single grace is given. The things we've been given, the hope. The calling, the provision, the strength, the restoration, the joy, the endurance, the reward all flow from God's grace in our life. So when we talk about restore here in verse 10, right? Who called you to his eternal glory will himself restore, establish, strengthen, support. What are we talking about? When we talk about restore, God is able to perfect us and mend, and mend anything that may need repair. This conveys the idea of mending a net or restoring a bone to its right place when it's out of joint. God himself will set us right so that nothing is lacking as he shapes us into the image of the Son. Secondly, establish. That word means to ground someone, and it carries the idea of having a firm footing. Once he's restored us, God gives us a firm foundation of, under our feet to, to stand on. But then not just restore, not just establish, but to strengthen also. The root word of strength is reminiscent of God's promise to Israel. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you in my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41, chapter 41, verse 10. So he restores us. Then he's established us in that firm foundation. He strengthens us as we go forward. And then he supports us. God has laid the foundation of our lives with Jesus himself as our cornerstone. As we've talked about in 1 Peter chapter 2. Jesus used this same word when he described the wise men building the house on the solid rock foundation. Thus enabling it to withstand the rains, the rising water, and the winds, according to Matthew chapter 7. He supports us because he's restored us, because he's established us and restored us to that firm foundation under our feet. Because we have been strengthened, we are also supported in all this. So how does your hope for eternity influence your everyday life? How does your hope for eternity influence your everyday life? Great question. How is it that people around you know that your hope in eternal life, 
matters so much to you that it's changed you and that it causes you to be different around those loved ones that you have or your neighbors that you have, the people that come in contact with you? How does it influence your everyday life? But then secondly, what will you do to maintain an eternal perspective regarding the hope that is yours in Christ? What are you going to do to make sure that that, that idea of being eternally secure and having that hope with Jesus, what are you going to do to make sure that doesn't fade in your life? Just a couple of questions for you to think on. Maybe we need to pause as we wrap up just to think on those two questions. But as we're wrapping up, just a couple of quick things. First, as we review, right, review review what this session and also the previous sections that we talked about in, in uh, First Peter. What has it taught you about hope? In the midst of this study that we've gone through, we're in chapter 5 now. What have you learned about hope in Jesus and in our God? Write down your understanding of hope and how it's impacted you. Also, pray. Write out 1 Peter 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 5b through 11, what this Bible study is, and use it as a guide for praying. And as you pray, surrender to the Lord and His eternal purposes in your life. And understand where humility needs to be involved, but also where you need to be aware of the things going on around you with Satan on the prowl. Uh, and then pray together. Maybe you need to gather a few people together and just say, hey, we need to lift one another up in prayer. And we need to pray for Christians all around the globe. Uh, one place you can go is the imb.org slash pray. And it'll help you go through certain cities that need to be held. Two weeks ago, I talked about per the persecuted church. And uh, I think that was opendoors.com or .org. Uh, but it talks about all the countries in the world that are that are being people are being persecuted in there because they believe in the name of Jesus Christ. There's a book you also I would recommend reading. It's called The Insanity of God by uh, uh, Ripken is his last name, um, and and it's a great book because he was a missionary that went to Somali, Somalia back in the 90s. But then when they came home, what he did, he started looking at all the persecuted churches in other areas. And it tells story after story about persecuted believers in the past decade. Persecuted believers and how they just cannot give up the name of their God because of what God has done in their life. And they're being persecuted, like New Testament persecution, like, you know, gladiator style kind of persecution and their countries because of what they believe in Jesus. So lift them up in prayers, lift yourself up in prayers and your friends up in prayer. But remember we have a hope that is eternal, it is secure. And that hope in Christ gives us power to overcome anything in this world as we look forward, forward to the world that we really belong to. And that's the world in which our God lives and is preparing a place for us in heaven. All right, thank you for joining us today. Let me close us in prayer. Dear God, I thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus, the hope that your son is secured, and by us accepting as is secured in our life, and let us remember that we don't belong here. We belong in heaven with you. But Father, our ministry, our mission, our goals here, Father, are to reach out and bring people with us into heaven. Let us be bold in that. Let the hope of our secure, eternal security in our life let it shine bright for others to come to know you in a saving way. Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters around the world that are being persecuted and uh, that can't meet in churches because of persecution, that can't talk openly about the name of Jesus Christ, or they'll be imprisoned, or they'll be uh, hurt, or their family will be taken away. I pray and ask whether you be with them, strengthen them, encourage them, Father, uh, during this time. In your name we pray and ask it. Amen. All right. Thank you all for joining me today. We'll see you next week.